Good morning, and welcome to the annual Burson Yellow Lecture. The Burson Yellow Memorial Lectureship is awarded to the physician scientist and researcher who embodies the extraordinary investigative spirit and selflessness of its namesakes, Dr. Solomon Burson and Dr. Rosalind Yellow. The award began in 1980 as the Solomon A. Burson Lecture in recognition of his groundbreaking work in clinical biochemistry and his years of dedication to Mount Sinai Hospital. In collaboration with Dr. Rosalind Yellow, Dr. Burson helped develop a number of groundbreaking antigen assays for various hormones, including insulin, parathyroid hormone, ACTH, and growth hormones. Their work formed the foundation of modern nuclear medicine. Beginning this year, we have renamed the award the Burson Yellow Memorial Lectureship in recognition of Dr. Yellow's equally significant contributions. It should be noted that neither scientists passionate in these processes nor profited commercially from their medical and scientific breakthroughs. Dr. Burson later served as a chair of Department of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital from 1968 to 1972. In, doctor, uh, in 1977, Dr. Yallo received a Nobel Prize for their joint work. This year's recipient is Dr. Nina Bardwash, Professor of Medicine and Urology and a Director of Immunotherapy, Medical Director of the Vaccine and Cell Therapy Laboratory, and Co-Director of the Cancer Immunology Program at the Tisch Cancer Institute. Dr. Bardwash received her MD and PhD from NYU and went on to complete her internship at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Bardwatcher's research focuses upon developing novel therapeutic strategies, such as vaccines to treat cancer. She has made seminal contributions to human dendritic cell biology, specifically with respect to their isolation, subset discovery, immunobiology, antigen-presenting function, and use of vaccine adjuvants in humans. She developed toll-like receptor agonists and dendritic cell-based vaccines for the treatment of both cancer and infection in several investigator-initiated studies and has pioneered neoantigen vaccine studies at the Tisch Cancer Institute. In addition to her research, she also serves as the senior editor of the AACR Cancer Immunology Research Journal, senior editor for Frontiers Immunology, and consulting editor for the Journal of Clinical Investigation. She has published extensively and has been the recipient of numerous awards including having been named one of Scientific American Magazine's top 50 researchers in 2004 and the Fred uh, W. Alt Award for New Discoveries in Immunology from the Cancer Research Institute in 2015. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Bardwash on this very well-deserved award. So much. It's really an honor to be here today and to share um, actually more like a work in progress of the studies that we're doing here at Mount Sinai. And these are my disclosures. And once again, just um, want to <clears throat> honor both Drs. Burson and Yellow for the amazing work they did. I'm doubly honored because um, I actually also received the Burson Alumni Achievement Award when I was at NYU. So. I feel that Dr. Burson is following me wherever I go. <laughs> um, and uh, very grateful um, to the Department of Medicine for um, this uh, honor and award. Thank you so much. So um, many of you are familiar with the cancer immunity cycle. Um, this is just really a schematic of what happens when uh, cancers grow in the body and the immune system responds to um, as they proliferate. So um, when you have an adequate or good immune response, essentially what happens is that the tumors become infiltrated with an antigen-presenting cell that we call dendritic cells. These dendritic cells will eat up tumor antigens and then will traffic to draining lymph node where they um, process antigens into small peptides and present them on HLA molecules to T cells. This is where priming occurs. The T cells then leave the lymph node go back through the blood, back into the tumor, and through uh, recognition of these um, tumor antigen HLA molecules via T cell receptor, they're able to uh, 
uh, eventually and hopefully remove and kill the cancer cells. And we call this the cancer immunity cycle. Um, today we have achieved a lot of progress in, um, in, in effects in, in treating metastatic tumors, primarily in three areas. One is through the inhibition of checkpoint molecules that arise on T cells when cancers are growing aggressively. These are CTLA-4 and PD-1. And we now have antibodies approved in the clinic to treat these cancers with very high um, response rates, sometimes achieving 50% and also T cell therapies in the form of CAR T cells or T cells expressing receptors that recognize tumor antigens that can be delivered systemically and have had dramatic effects, for example, in childhood leukemias. And um, these discoveries of these checkpoint molecules and their treatment was highlighted by um, the Nobel Prize being awarded to Jim Allison and Tasuka Honjo in 2018 an event that actually was underscored by the arrival of many immunologists to help celebrate that uh, honor. So as a result of um, uh, what we know now in terms of the immune response to cancer outgrowth, immuno-oncology agents in the pipeline have proliferated dramatically. And just last year, there were close to 4,000 IO agents in the global drug development pipeline, as you can see here. But when you look at what's actually been approved, shown here in sort of this yellow color, you'll see it's actually a minority of agents. And in particular, when you look at the cancer vaccine pipeline, there's just very few that have been approved, although hundreds still being investigated. And today, when you think about what's been approved, we have really a very small percentage of those in preclinical clinical development that are actually available for us to use. As you know, they include preventive vaccines for Hep B and HPV. And in terms of therapeutic vaccines, we really don't have much. We have a product called Cipulucil T, which is a dendritic cell-based vaccine for prostate cancer, BCG to treat early bladder cancer, micromod for skin cancers, and oncolytic viruses. So, you know, when you think about cancer vaccines, they, they really should be effective. The idea is when you vaccinate against a tumor antigen, you can make uh, a de novo T cell response that should effectively eliminate tumor cells. You can vaccinate with antigens uh, against which pre-existing immunity also occurs, so you can amplify an existing response. Or you can generate what we call epitope spreading by killing off tumor cells, releasing new antigens, and then repriming the immune system. So what is the issue? Well, unfortunately, cancer vaccines have low immunogenicity in the metastatic setting. We are tolerant partially complete to many of the antigens expressed by tumor cell because tumor cells are self cells. They're going to express antigens that are shared with normal cells to which we should normally be tolerized. Two microenvironments are highly immunosuppressive. The tumor can escape from the immune response by losing, for example, its antigen or its HLA molecules, the molecule necessary to present an antigenic epitope. Tumors can be cold, meaning even if you generated good T cells, they can't get into the tumor site for a number of reasons. They can be blocked because the blood flow is not good, the stroma is huge, there's a physical barrier, or there are other immune suppressive cells that basically uh, block the activity of the T cells. We don't have platforms that really induce durable, potent tumor responses. We don't have vaccines that target immune inhibitory mechanisms. And often the antigens that we use favor immune escape. So how can we improve cancer vaccines? Well, we've taken the approach of really going back to the drawing board and looking at how we can really essentially prime T cells well by focusing on this cell, the dendritic cell. This is the antigen presenting cell that is absolutely essential for um, priming a T cell response. These dendritic cells were discovered actually by my mentor at Rockefeller University in 1973, along with Zanvil Cohen, and this is Dr. Steinman, who received a Nobel Prize for this award in 2011. And he, in the mouse system, and we, in the human system, along with many other investigators, uh, showed and affirmed that in humans, what you need to get a good anti-tumor immune response is dendritic cells in the tumor bed, the dendritic cells eating dying tumor cells, a process that we call um, cross-presentation, cross-presentation of tumor antigens to T cells. 
activation of dendritic cells, ability to traffic to the draining lymph node, and then priming of helper T cells, CD4 cells, cytotoxic CD8 T cells, and ultimately um, trafficking back of the T cells to the tumor site. We were the first to show, actually, in a controlled study in healthy donors that dendritic cells were essential in a vaccine study where we compared antigen on DCs versus antigens alone in healthy volunteers. And we're able to show here, um, this is showing a response to an antigen called KLH, but we showed it to many other antigens, that dendritic cells, a single injection, were sufficient to prime humans um, to develop both CD4 and CD8 immunity. And this immunity is durable, it's long-lasting, and it can be boosted. We now actually know there are many subtypes of dendritic cells, um, and we know of the three that, that I may mention today, we can think about uh, DCs as DC1, 2, and PDCs. The DC1 in particular is very important um, in the tumor bed for acquiring these tumor antigens and cross-presenting them to T cells. In particular, CD8 T cells and DC2s are important for doing that for CD4 cells. And we now think that a complement of these three cells, uh, with this being the primary one, is the most efficient to inducing an anti-tumor immune response. Uh, studies from our own group, but also from Mary Moratz's group here, Max Crummel, UCSF, and Tom Gajewski and Stephanie Spranger at the University of Chicago have definitively shown that mobilization and recruitment of this DC1 subset into the tumor microenvironment is essential to get an anti-tumor immune response. We now know that recruitment into the tumor microenvironment depends upon chemokines and a hematopoietin called FLT3 ligand that is made by uh, NK cells in the tumor microenvironment and that these agents can be applied in experimental systems to enhance DC numbers in the tumor and combine with checkpoint inhibitors to um, promote uh, anti-tumor activity in mouse models um, such as in melanoma. That was shown by Miriam Group's group and others. So with all that information, what we're doing now is trying to understand how best to amplify or support DC-based vaccination here. And our group focuses in three particular areas, uh, what we call in situ vaccination, in which we're actually vaccinating within the tumor bed directly with the idea that we can um, wake up the immune system in a tumor site and make a cold tumor hot. The advantage here is that we can hopefully prime T cells that recognize all associated tumor antigens. Second approach is actually to mobilize and target DCs uh, more systemically uh, and prime T cells to, towards specific antigens that we can deliver. And then finally, I'll talk about how we are beginning to understand that tumors through their mutations can actually express a very personalized uh, platform of antigens which collectively um, immunologists call neoantigens. They are specific to the patient's tumor and because they are new, they're potentially very highly immunogenic. So I'm going to cover in the talk today each of these three areas. So let's start with in situ vaccination. Here the idea is uh, to inject a tumor with an intratermal immune modulator, thereby activating these DCs and uh, ensuring the, the uptake of endogenous tumor antigens so that they can then go on and prime CD4 and CD8. Uh, T cells, and hopefully control tumor growth by making a cold tumor that doesn't have many T cells to begin with hot. And so this idea really came from uh, Dr. Coley over basically 100 years ago when he was at Memorial, and what he started, he had actually a really brilliant idea in retrospect of taking bacteria, killing them, and then injecting them directly into patients' tumors, and he actually had some clinical successes and they were referred to as Coley's toxins. And then doctors Old and Vanasareff went on to show that um, uh, mycobacteria could also reduce tumor burden in mice. And that study really formed the basis for the approval for BCG um, in uh, early bladder cancer. 
And so why do bacteria uh, actually have this effect? Well, we now know that dendritic cells have receptors called toll-like receptors that recognize different components of bacteria. And so we can make synthetic constructs um, such as DNA, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA, um, and ligate these receptors, which lead to the activation of dendritic cells in vitro as well as in vivo. And we focused on an agent called poly-ICLC, which is a synthetic double-stranded RNA, which actually activates a receptor called uh, TLR3, which is uh, highly expressed on the DC1 that I mentioned earlier, which is the, the key cross-presenting DC. So um, our colleagues have made a, this synthetic double-stranded RNA. We know that in vitro, it induces a lot of IL-12 and type 1 interferons, key cytokines that are important for DC uh, function and priming of T cells. We know that this particular agent also primes um, CD8 T cells towards tumor antigens in vitro very effectively and is better than most other TLR agonists that we've tested. And in a pilot study of just one patient, we, um, as a compassionate use agent, we injected this young man who had a terrible sarcoma in his head, um, actually eating into his brain, with um, this agent and uh, actually got the tumor to necrose and eventually fall off. And this young man lived much longer than he should have, but unfortunately passed away. <coughs> and these studies really formed the basis of a trial where we decided to use poly-ICLC and deliver it intratumorally um, uh, here at Mount Sinai. And um, I've had the good fortune to work with many great collaborators here, uh, including our clinicians here, Philip Friedlander and Tom Marin. And so this first study, uh, initially a phase one and now a phase two study, was to evaluate safety and therapeutic efficacy of intratumor poly-IC, patients with solid tumors, to see whether we could induce an immune response and also whether we could have mm -hmm. local tumor impact as well as systemic tumor impact. And in this trial, we gave poly-IC intratumorally six times over two weeks, then IM, then we had a rest, and we had three cycles. Um, this was actually pretty safe. Um, we didn't have uh, high-grade AEs that were definitively related to the injection site. Uh, mostly we had local uh, skin or um, subcutaneous types of reactions and, and uh, systemic things like fever and, and muscle pain. So this is just a, a list of the patients that have been enrolled so far. Um, and I'll just highlight that out of 21, we had five patients who had a clinical response, so about a 20% response rate, including two who had a complete response. And I'll just quickly show you those. We had a patient with CTCL who was given poly-IC into a primary target lesion. You can see that over time, the tumor regressed, and even distal sites regressed over time. Um, eventually, the tumors did recur after the patient went off the trial and went on other therapy, but the patient remained stable and alive at this point. We had another patient with Cesare syndrome. Uh, also, the Cesare syndrome uh, disappeared and eventually did recur and went on Nevo, which is an anti-PD-1 therapeutic agent, and the patient's now disease-free. And then here's another example patient with squamous cell with a tumor at the injection site also necrosed. So we are seeing subsets of patients that do respond which is very gratifying. And we went in to look to see whether we had actually made these tumors hot after the, being cold. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but from baseline, we had very few T cells in there. And then after injection, this was a head and neck cancer patient. We now see infiltration of um, CD8 and CD4 cells, as well as dendritic cells. And we see upregulation of the checkpoint molecule PDL1 probably in response to the type 1 interferon that this, this agent is inducing in vivo. When we looked at the uh, signatures in the tumor and the blood of this responder, we were also able to sh show markers of dendritic cell infiltration, activation, and also infiltration of uh, the innate immu immune cells uh, like NK cells, very consistent with our hypothesis. So that was very gratifying. And so with the, that data, 
we've gone on to think about two things. One, can we move this therapy earlier in treatment? Can we, instead of giving it to patients who have these resistant metastatic cancers, can we go in earlier in the neoadjuvant setting? And so working here with Dr. Zanera and Tawari, we um, have been injecting this agent directly into patients' uh, prostate cancer lesions, patients who have intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer, who are then scheduled to undergo a radical prostatectomy. So the idea here is that patients come in, they, uh, and then you'll see here Dr. Tawari is actually injecting poly -AC directly into a tumor lesion here. Um, and they will get uh, into a selected site, poly-IC, into uh, one injection in the first cohort or two injections in the second cohort. And then we can take out the prostate, uh, and then we can look actually at the injected site versus non-injected tumor sites versus normal sites uh, adjacent to the injected site. And so far, we've, we've actually done seven patients, six of whom underwent pro a radical prostatectomy. Uh, not surprisingly, after resection, the PSA council went down, but four of the six who underwent prostatectomy actually had a reduction in their PATH Gleason scores. And in those that we've started to look at now, we are seeing, without going into much detail, uh, infiltration of the injected sites, uh, as well as adjacent tumor sites with innate immune cells and evidence um, when we looked at, um, at this at tumor uh, sites genomically, T cell infiltration, innate immune infiltration, and the production of type 1 interferon as well, suggesting that we have impacted these sites locally. So just to summarize this first part, what I've shown you in our studies is that in situ vaccination has clinical impact in the metastatic setting. When we see responders, it coincides with dendritic cell recruitment, innate immune signatures, and T cell infiltration. We can now give uh, poly -AC in the new adjuvant setting safely. It's feasible, and those studies are ongoing. With the, and we are seeing the potential of changing the tumor microenvironment locally. And in studies published by my colleague, uh, Josh Brody, here at the TCI, He's also shown that this approach of intratermal poly-IC, given with radiation therapy to uh, kill tumor cells, release antigens, and dendritic cell mobilization has clinical responses in patients with uh, B-cell lymphoma. It was published last year. So our next steps really are to now combine this approach of in situ vaccination with approved therapies like anti-CTLA-4 or an anti-PD-1. And so what we're doing now is we've opened uh, three trials where we are now combining poly-ICLC uh, intraterminally with systemic anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1. We've also chosen to test whether we need the intraterminal poly-IC. Can we give poly-ICLC intramuscularly in conjunction with anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1? And then finally, we are uh, in the middle of a trial where we're actually giving anti-CTLA-4 also in the tumor and anti-PD-L1 systemically. And this trial is exciting because we're seeing early evidence of clinical impact in very highly resistant metastatic breast cancer patients. So, um, so it's an exciting area, and I think um, certainly a lot more to do, and uh, hopefully I'll can come back and share the results of those studies with you. So in the second part of the talk, I'd like to talk to you now about how we can use systemic vaccination to mobilize and target disease to promote efficacy of cancer vaccines. <clears throat> and remember I told you earlier that um, the imprinting of an, an effective anti-tumor response requires that a, the tumors have a lot of uh, these DC1 subsets in their tumors. So in situ vaccination could be very good, but if we don't have the DCs in there, it's really not going to work very well. So how can we bypass that step? Well, one thing we can do is actually artificially increase DC subsets within the tumor and in the blood by delivering this hematopoietin FLT3 ligand. FLT3 ligand was previously shown um, by our colleagues to mobilize DCs, all three DC subsets in humans. Uh, safely and effectively, 
um, and reversibly. And the next step, uh, once you mobilize these DCs, is that we can target DCs with the vaccine by using um, uh, an antigen that is targeted to an antibody that specifically recognizes a receptor on DCs, and then we can activate the DCs with our favorite adjuvant, poly-ICLC, to enhance the cross-presentation of tumor antigen. And for, for our studies, we've chosen to use um, antigens that are derived from the cancer testis family of tumor antigens. There are many, many categories of tumor antigens. But here we focused on two cancer testis antigens and neoantigens that I'll talk about in the last part of my presentation. And the cancer testis antigen we focused on is NYESO1. NYESO1 was discovered at Memorial um, by Dr. Ohl's group. It's an antigen that is called uh, uh, a CT antigen. It's present only in germinal tissues and in tumors. Um, uh, after epigenetic uh, modulation, it gets expressed. And uh, what we've learned is that it's present in very high frequencies in a variety of different tumors, especially melanoma, and that is spontaneously immunogenic. As patients' uh, tumors grow, especially in the metastatic setting, a number of these patients will spontaneously develop antibodies as well as T cell responses to this antigen, indicating that actually it is probably a pretty decent tumor antigen. And in fact, we now know from studies um, that have delivered T cells, carrying T cell receptors that recognize NYESO1 to patients with synovial sarcomas, uh, which actually have very, very high rates of this antigen, these can actually be um, potentially curative. So we took advantage of um, uh, a vaccine that comprises NYESO1 that is fused in frame to an antibody that targets the C-type lectin receptor DEC205. DEC205 is actually present on all the three DC subsets I showed you earlier, DC1, DC2, and PDC. So it theoretically should be able to target NYESO1 into the dendritic cell where the dendritic cells can process the antigen in their endosomes and present processed uh, antigenic peptide on their HLA molecules. So with that, we, we initiated a study um, with the CITN group uh, in resected melanoma patients. They've had their tumors removed, so this adjuvant setting, and divide them into two cohorts. Uh, cohorts both cohorts one and two received four of these uh, DEC-205 NYESO1 vaccines with poly-ICLC every month, a total of four injections. But cohort one, prior to the first two vaccines, also delivered, uh, were, uh, were given a 10-day course of the hematopoietin FLT3 ligand. So the idea was to see, by mobilizing dendritic cells systemically with FLT3 ligand, can we enhance the efficacy of this vaccine? And so what we found, first of all, was that in cohort one, um, hopefully you can see it, we were able to show that there was a very nice rise in the uh, DC fraction shown here in red and orange, coincident with the administration of the FLT3 ligand prior to the first two vaccines. We also saw a nice increase in NK cells and monocytes. Cohort two, which didn't receive it, didn't, we didn't see any rise in these uh, innate immune populations. Then we went on to look at the antibody response to NYESO1. Uh, I think you can see that cohort one developed antibody titers much higher than cohort two, and we were able to see induction of antibodies even after one vaccination. Whereas for cohort two, we really needed three vaccinations to actually get a decent antibody response. And then we looked at the T cell response. Here's cohort one, cohort two. Here we're looking at T cells in blood uh, re-exposed to the NYESO1 antigen, and then we look for interferon gamma production as a measure of their priming ability. And I think you can see from just the dots that the proportion of patients um, recognizing NYESO1 is higher than cohort two. And then here's just a summary of the percent recognizing NYESO1 over the course of vaccination. And what we found was that at one time, if you consider all time po points, 100% of cohort one patients developed a T cell response, whereas just about uh, a third of cohort two patients developed a T cell response. So in effect, the addition of FIT3 ligand dramatically enhanced the vaccine response. And when we looked in blood to see whether the effect of this hematopoietin um, 
had any effect on circulating innate immune cells. I don't expect you to look at this in detail. Uh, the bottom line was that in cohort one versus cohort two, we saw very, very dramatic changes in inflammation, immune response, interferon modules, and in DC um, activation and monocyte activation signatures. So, in effect, what we found was just a simple addition of a DC mobilizing agent dramatically improved vaccination um, to um, a vaccine that has been used in prior studies, but um, has, now, has now we've achieved a three to fourfold increase in efficiency. So we found, as I showed you, that foot three ligand induced increases in activation of, and uh, numbers of several innate immune cells, in particular DCs, potent immune responses and an integrated immune responses of both antibody and T cells. Is this meaningful? Well, we now know in melanoma at least, um, anti-PD-1 and CTLA-4 have been approved. There are approved therapies in the adjuvant setting and have been shown to improve survival and recurrence rates, or time to recurrence. Um, and um, we have actually gone back and done a retrospective study where we looked at patients who've undergone NYSE1 vaccination. And vaccine immunotherapy has been associated with longer recurrence-free and overall survival. So we're now planning to combine this vaccine approach with anti-PD-1 in patients um, who've had their melanomas resected to see how well they do. And we are also here at Mount Sinai. We've opened studies where we are combining FLT3 ligand, um, also known as CDX301, in prostate cancers um, with Dr. Owen Galski. We're using a PSMA, PSA DNA vaccine uh, with anti-PD-1. We're adding this agent to our in-situ vaccine approach. And we are opening a, a trial here in ER positive breast cancers. We're going to add FLT3 ligand with anti-PD-1 and radiation uh, in neoadjuvant setting in ER positive breast cancers in effort to change the response um, to conventional therapy. And then finally, I'm going to end by telling you about our studies in um, the neoantigen field. So um, I've shared with you results looking at CT antigens, but what's emerged in immunotherapy recently is this concept of personalized cancer vaccination. And that has come from the recognition that um, obviously tumors have mutations, and um, some, not many, to um, tumors having, you know, thousands of mutations. But what we've come to appreciate is these mutations, in some cases, are transcribed and then translated. And uh, when they're translated, they, these are variant proteins. And, and as such, they're what we call neoantigens. Um, the fact that these neoantigens can be recognized has come from the identification of neoantigen-specific T cells in tumors. And so we've asked the question, as of many others in the field, is that because these are patient-specific, they're new, they haven't previously been recognized immune system, they're not subject to be tolerized, at least initially, these could be potentially highly immunogenic um, antigens. And so the goal here is, um, was to establish an, a protocol to identify neoantigens, create vaccines, and then give them back to patients with checkpoint blockade. So neoantigens can be considered unique or private because each patient's tumor is different. They can actually be shared or so-called public neoantigens, such as the KRAS mutation that is shared in, in pancreatic cancers and other cancers. Or they can be shared as a result of shared frame shifts, uh, and I'll talk about that later. So the idea here, as I mentioned, is that when there's a mutation in a, a, pro, in a gene in a tumor, you get a variant uh, RNA, a messenger RNA, that translates into a variant protein and can be processed into variant peptides. These variant peptides can be presented on class I molecules on a tumor cell or an antigen presenting cell and then recognized by the T cell receptor on uh, a T cell. And um, when you look at the breadth of mutations in various cancers, you can see that they can be very low, such as in sarcomas, 
to very high, as in melanomas, lung cancer, bladder, head and neck cancers. Um, so there's a whole range of mutations. Um, and when we look at um, mutational burden and a response to immunotherapy, there is a general, not absolute, but a general correlation between tumors that have high tumor burden, mutational tumor burden like melanoma, head, neck, bladder cancers, and an objective response to immunotherapy. Basically telling us that um, tumors with high mutation burden uh, essentially have higher levels of neoantigens and that these are actually recognized by the immune system in a way that when you deliver checkpoint therapy uh, to patients, you can enhance through priming or amplification the response these, to these neoantigens. And um, this, this idea has been substantiated in a number of vaccine trials that have been published recently in melanoma and in GBM. And importantly, in, in studies showing that if you take T cells out of a patient uh, that recognize a patient-specific neoantigens, grow them up in the lab ex vivo, and then deliver them back to a patient. You can actually, in, in one particular case of a patient with breast cancer and a patient with cholangiocarcinoma, carcinoma, cure the patient of their tumors. So, so neoantigen-specific T cell, when elicited, has the potential to cure a, t a tumor. So the field is evolving, and there are many unknowns. We still have to think about how do we best identify these neoantigens, how do we best immunize our patients when we've identified these neoantigens. And so when I first came here um, about six years ago, we set about trying to develop our own neoantigen discovery platform, which we call OpenVax. We spent some time validating this platform in uh, animal models uh, of cancer. And we have now opened trials to um, validate the uh, our, our um, OpenVax platform in cancer patients, looking at both unique as well as shared neoantigens. So our computational pipeline called OpenVax was developed by Alex Rubenstein, Julia Kodish, a number of other investigators. Um, and I won't go this into detail, but we have um, a platform that allows us to sequence DNA, RNA, prioritize express variants, and then predict neoantigens <coughs> using uh, a ranking system that um, differentiates this selection uh, process um, that's detailed here from others in the field. We've developed what we call a personalized genome vaccine pipeline in our GMP lab that can take tumor and blood samples all the way from DNA RNA isolation sequencing, vaccine peptide selection to manufacture and administration. Basically, it takes about one to two weeks from surgery to sequencing data, a week to run this pipeline and review, up to eight weeks for peptide synthesis. And, we can now, and with that, we can deliver 10 or more vaccinations over a period of six months. So these are my clinical colleagues in, in this endeavor here to, to put PGV vaccines into the clinic. Um, we have three trials ongoing now. One in solid tumors and multiple myeloma, one with Adelia Hormigo in GBM, and one with Matt Galski in bladder cancer in combination with the Um And these studies are run with our OpenVax team, Philip Friedlander, Tom Marin, and our um, Marsha Messick and Monty Saxena in the GMP lab. And so I'll just tell you about a couple of studies in the last part of the presentation. Um, the first is PGV-001, where we wanted to determine safety, tolerability, feasibility of our PGV vaccine, patients with multiple solid tumors and multiple myeloma. Um, we give uh, the vaccine in the form of long peptides, about 25 amino acids long, 100 micrograms with a tetanus helper epitope and poly CLC. This is the vaccine schedule. This is our cohort. We started with 20 patients and have vaccinated 13. You can see this is the variety of tumors. Um, very safe, actually, for the most part. We had a few grade threes. These were anemia, low lymphocyte count, failure to thrive. And this is our swimmer's plot um, at showing the 13 patients who were vaccinated. Um, we had a mean of 71 new antigens identified. We gave uh, a close to 
10 uh, peptide vaccines uh, per patient. Um, most patients received at least seven vaccines, uh, with about 11 receiving all 10 doses, and we met safety and feasibility endpoints. Two of our patients have passed away due to progression. One withdrew, and the rest are, continue to be followed um, in our clinic. And I'll just show you some initial immune monitoring data. Here's our first patient. This is, again, looking at a T cell response to the immunizing epitopes. Um, gamma interferon LE spot. You can see that after treatment, our patients, this is an ex vivo, meaning we can take a patient's blood, put it right into culture, expose it to our immunizing epitopes, and look for gamma interferon response. We're able to see very nice induction of uh, gamma interferon response. And the first three patients, 50 to 90 percent of our selected epitopes were shown to elicit either CD4 or a CD8 immune response. And although this is early, this is actually better than the published studies where it's more like 30 uh, percent or, or 40 percent. So um, we are validating OpenVax in, in this study and the studies that I mentioned in GPM, uh, as well as in bladder cancer. But arguably, this is a very personalized vaccine approach. And for each patient's tumor, we have to do a lot of work to identify these and predict these, and then we have to make them, and it's very, very expensive, as you might imagine. So is there a way we can actually uh, identify shared neoantigens, i.e. off-the-shelf antigens, in certain cancers where we can just make these antigens in bulk and then deliver them? Well, there are a couple of cases where we can do that that we've identified here at Mount Sinai, and I'll talk about one of them in the final part of our talk. And this was work that was actually done by uh, fellow in the lab, Chancey Chan Bosgus, in collaboration with Drs. Mascarenas, Hoffman, and Anne Rubin here uh, in the heme department. And this is work um, that we did with them after we had a conversation um, thinking about myelo myeloproliferative neoplasms. And these are clonal disorders um, where uh, comprising P. vera, ET, and primary myelofibrosis. And in these two conditions, it turns out um, recently, actually not that long ago, a subset of these patients were identified as having mutations in the cow reticulin gene. A cow reticulin, as you may know, is a chaperone protein. It's important for shepherding antigens um, uh, and process peptides in particular through the class one presentation pathway. And up to a third of these patients have these mutations. And it turns out that the patients who have these mutations tend to do better in terms of survival overall. What's the nature of these mutations? There so are primarily two types of mutations, 52 base pair deletion and insertion, um, and many other types. But interestingly, all these mutations result in a frame shift um, that leads to an alternative reading frame in exon 9, where the C-terminus of the new cow reticulin protein is actually identical. So all these patients have an identical 36 amino acid C-terminal region. So we hypothesized that this could be a shared neoantigen in this subset of patients. And so what Chansu did was to prepare peptides covering the C-terminus as well as the wild type, and then asked the question, if we just took several patients with ET or MF, would these patients have spontaneous immune responses? to the uh, mutated uh, protein. And we did find them, this uh, gamma interferon LA spot, although they were weak, in a subset of patients, um, actually um, ab about five or so out of a total of 18. And we wondered why we, didn't, we weren't seeing these spontaneous immune responses in other patients. So we went on to show that, in fact, in this condition, their circulating T cells, compared to a healthy donor, have very high levels of PD-1, and CTLA-4, which are those checkpoint molecules I, I talked about earlier, meaning that these T cells have shut off and are no longer able to respond when they're re-exposed to antigen. And so we went on to, in our culture systems, add anti-PD-1 and CTLA-4 to see whether we could, in fact, recover these responses. And sure enough, in a subset of patients uh, compared to no inhibitor, could recover actually quite dramatically an underlying immune response, meaning these patients have been immunized already. They're just not, their T cells are just not working that well. 
So that was an exciting development. And then we took advantage of an ongoing trial um, that John Mascarinus was doing where he was administering anti-PD-1 to patients with primary or secondary MF, uh, in this case with pembrolizumab. And one patient happened to have a calreticulin mutation. And so we did a deep dive interrogation of the response of that patient. And what we were able to see is that at baseline, the patient had very few T cells in their circulation. But once they got pembrolizumab, they got you know, up to seven uh, uh, fold increase in circulating T cell numbers, both CD4 as well as CD8, indicating a dramatic increase in the ability of T cells to proliferate. And in vitro, we were able to show that the addition of anti-PD-1 could also restore the ability of the t patient's T cells to recognize the, this mutated calreticulin protein. We've gone on to sequence the patient's T cell receptors, and basically what I'll tell you is that after the addition of the anti-PD-1 uh, in vivo in the patient, the circulating T cells uh, expanded. We saw expansion of existing clones as well as the development of novel T cell populations that we could also identify in our in vitro cultures, suggesting but not proving that we were amplifying these calreticulin specific T cells. And so the idea really is can we use this protein in a vaccine for these patients, especially early on in their disease? And we've gone on to show that if we just take healthy donor T cells and we culture them with um, over a period of time with these calreticulin mutated peptides, we can prime both CD8 as well as CD4 T cells, shown here, uh, in vitro, uh, indicating that um, we should be able to immunize these patients o over time. So, so just to end this last section then, what I've shown you is that in fact mutated calreticulin does have neoantigens. They're recognized by CD8 and CD4 cells. Unfortunately, in patients over time, this leads to T cell exhaustion in their condition without regulation of these checkpoint molecules. Um, we can potentially enhance uh, immunity against these mutations with checkpoint inhibitors, and these patients may benefit from newer immunotherapy regimens targeting um, this mutated covered reticulum with anti PD1. And so we now have a trial actually in the works, it's going through the approval process where we're going to do just that. We're going to immunize patients um, with these mutations um, using this off-the-shelf vaccine as a first step and show safety and then hopefully add uh, anti-PD-1 in, in, in follow-up. So I'm going to end there. I hopefully during the talk have thanked all my wonderful collaborators here at Mount Sinai. I wanted to say um, it's really been a pleasure to be here because the one thing about Mount Sinai is that you have the most, we have the most amazing collaborative group of clinicians, scientists, um, uh, translational scientists to work with. And so it has made it really fun to do all this work. So thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>
certain types of radiation therapy as a means to activate and wake up the immune system. Um, there's also chemotherapy. You know, we traditionally never thought of chemotherapy as being immunogenic, but we know chemotherapy fits, certain kinds of chemotherapy fits into classes, what you call inducing immunogenic cell death. Um, again, killing tumor cells, releasing agents within tumor cells like RNA, DNA, proteins that can ligate uh, innate immune sensors and activate innate immune cells. So, um, you know, it's very exciting because now we can think about, um, you know, in lung cancer, you're combining chemotherapy with that <laughs> trip point therapy. We can think about traditional modalities in combination with immunotherapy in, in different ways. Very, very exciting talk. Thank you so much. May I ask you two questions? One is, uh, has there been any difference in the overall survival historically from those patients treated for years with BCG, AVR, or something of the sort? Absolutely. Uh, you know, with BCG is approved therapy for non-Muslim basic bl bladder cancer. So, um, you know, half of those patients do respond. Um, so that is sort of a approved first line. And I think what's exciting now is that actually is being combined also with other um, therapies uh, in, uh, as well. So, um, and then in the case of the other approved therapies, the, the dendritic cell vaccine, which, you know, arguably didn't give you much more survival, you know, it was a four month improvement of survival metastatic prostate cancer, is now being tested much earlier um, in, in prostate cancer patients with the hope that perhaps giving it earlier will have greater impact. Um, so, and then there are the oncolytic viruses. Um, I know Peter Palazzi is here, he's working on that with NDV. Um, but there is an approved um, uh, TVEC uh, herpes virus for a non receptible melanoma. Um, which can be given in conjunction with anti-PD-1. So, and then there are many, I haven't cited many, many studies that are ongoing that are using uh, other immune modulators injected directly into the tumor um, that target TR7, 9, sting, uh, in combination with cytokines. So, you know, the combinations are crazy. And as you showed that first slide, it's like a four, almost 4,000 studies. Um, so the challenge is going to be parsing all this out. Sorry, very exciting minutes. In terms of your last part, the personalized vaccine, uh, you give the T cell epitopes as peptides. Yes. But in nature, we have wonderful uh, T cell epitopes, but they are never given in, in, in terms of humans. Yeah. Uh, they are never given as peptides. So my question is, can one think of making these I don't want to call them Otherwise, but these epitopes more immunogenic. Yes, absolutely. Because nature does it a different way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we did this really because that was the easiest and the simplest way to get going. But we are talking to a number of collaborators, uh, industry partners, to formulate these vaccines in different ways. Our prostate cancer trial is actually a DNA vaccine um, that is, is being given um, in conjunction with DNA that encodes IL-12. Uh, and this DNA is a sting activator, so that's that platform. But we are working with partners to formulate in nanoparticles and also to deliver in virus, viral vectors. So, um, I didn't, okay. yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really glad you raised that because I, didn't, I don't want you to think that peptide vaccine platforms are the way to go. No, the, these are tools for us to better understand and, and um, our prediction pipeline, confirm immunogenicity. But really, we need, you're absolutely right, we need much, much better adjuvant platforms to make our vaccines mimic what really happens naturally. So obviously, the other side of this is the, what I see, which is in transplant or other people here, are autoimmunity. Yeah, so obviously the more specific you can get, the better, because the less likely you are to induce some sort of um, non-intended right. immune response. Are there any studies, are you doing any studies along with this to try and identify individuals that might be more prone to develop an autoimmune response? Mm -hmm. uh, we do sort of very basic standard, you know, autoimmunity checks, but they by no means predictive. 
Um, obviously, we don't, in our first passes, we don't include patients who have history of autoimmunity or an underlying condition. Um, but so we are seeing, um, you know, with car, car therapies, we are seeing evidence of autoimmunity when the antigen that's targeted is also expressed in normal right. tissue. That has been described for, unfortunately, for mage antigens and crusher activity with tightening the heart. We're seeing it now in the brain. So I think one, one issue is that we are unfortunately going to see some autoimmunity when we least expect it. That's happening. Or we can't always predict it. But, but in terms of screening, mm -hmm. other than screening for is this antigen present or not in normal tissue, um, with potentially banking so that one can go back and look that, and go, yes, okay, we can do that. Is, yes, is, yeah. absolutely. And we actually are banking sera and cells from our melanoma patients who are getting checkpoint therapy um, in, in an effort to see whether those that do get some autoimmune side effect. We, we actually have gone back and looked at some of these patients. We've actually, and it's very early in a couple of patients, identified antibodies that have targeted liver antigens in patients who've had elevated LFTs and things like that. So it's, it's emerging here, evolving. Great. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.